Hey guys, Dantix here, back with some juicy Dragon Age Veilguard details. You may have seen the new gameplay, but the devs have also discussed mind-changing information about the game that wasn't revealed in the footage. The man, the legend, the world-class gardener, Shinobi602 has made a summary of features that are coming to Dragon Age the Veilguard that weren't obvious in the presentation and will hype a lot of you up. This summary is actually what increased my hype for the game and I'm hoping it does so for you as well. If not, well, go back to being excited for nothing. I'll weave in key pieces of information from sources such as Eurogamer, IGN and Bioware's most passionate Mass Effect lead, Michael Gamble, who all have had a chance to see or play the game. There's a ton to cover including playable races, nudity, blood, classes, difficulty specializations, momentum attacks, weaknesses, combos, backgrounds, no microtransactions and account linking, body sliders, romances and more. So let's get right into it. First, the comment preventing housekeeping, which is probably counterproductive to making a video, but it's coming to PS5, Xbox Series X and PC in fall 2024. So you can't play it on Switch. Sorry, Nintendo fans. Insert joke about how it could probably run on the Switch, right? Consoles have quality and performance modes, which go up to 60 frames per second. Photo mode is confirmed, but what may excite a lot of you is that it's fully offline single player, no EA account linking with no microtransactions. So you can play it on the plane on the way to whatever meeting all you grumps attend. Listen, you can play as a human, an elf, a dwarf, or a canary. So you'll have racial choices, something we don't get in other Bioware titles like Mass Effect. Expect each choice to echo some gameplay differences, but unlike Origins, you don't start in a different area. You get to choose your backstory though, which will change up things, with six factions to choose from. Each faction has deep roots in Thetis, the Antiven Crows, the Grey Wardens, the Shadow Dragons, who we learned are a resistance group of Tevinter Mages opposing slavery in the Imperium, the Veil Jumpers, Lords of Fortune, and the Morn Watch. So the difference is each faction offers three distinct buffs, like being able to hold an extra potion or do extra damage against certain enemies, and they have the odd reference in dialogue, and their start will be different. I'm excited for the Antiven Crows and the Grey Wardens in particular, because I can only imagine what kind of gameplay consequences they'll lead to. If you're part of the Crows, will you take assassination missions, get a visit from old friends, or worse? As a Grey Warden, will you have responsibilities, get vision, you'll no doubt get bonuses to Darkspawn. There's so much potential with backgrounds and we saw it matter recently in the gameplay as the character's Shadow Dragon choice came up a few times in dialogue within a short time span. Both of you have done some work for the Shadow Dragons. Isn't that a coincidence? Some old friends said if I was working in Tevinter, the Shadow Dragons are worth trusting. John Epler tells Games Radar, Faction affects a bunch of things. Certain conversation options are only available to you. So Grey Wardens, for example, get conversational options that focus on the blight. They know more about it than other people. It also impacts how people talk to you. So you'll get reactivity from characters and then faction reactivity from plots related to that faction. So expect your choice to matter. You can customize your Inquisitor from Dragon Age Inquisition in the character creator and make a few key decisions that will impact how the Veil Guard begins. So you can't exactly import your Inquisitor, more on that later. I take it your choices here will impact how the game begins. Perhaps what stage Solus is all depends on how you treated him throughout Inquisition, but we'll just have to wait and see because there are some killer cameos from past games that show up. And just for your information, it seems they've been tracking Solus for nine years before this point. Michael Gamble says it's something we'll learn about. So expect the typical warrior, rogue, and mage class choice at the start. Warriors use sword and shield or two-handed weapons to send enemies flying. Rogues utilize quick movement and reflexes. You can wield a bow or dual wield swords with powerful precise strikes for lethal damage. Mages use magic to incinerate, freeze, electrocute, and crush. Some cast from afar while others prefer close quarters combat. So yes, all of them will have ways to specialize. Each class has three sub-specializations, such as Duelist, Saboteur, or Veil Ranger for the Rogue. It seems as though the Rogue in the gameplay started with a Veil Ranger skill, Static Strikes, as it's more magical than your typical Rogue. So people, myself included, are speculating that you can choose your sub-specialization at the start of the game, though it's entirely possible that your background plays a part in what skills you start with, as the Shadow Dragons are a more magical-focused faction. 
Classes also have a unique resource system. For example, the rogue has momentum, which builds up as you land consecutive hits. We saw this represented in the rogue gameplay as a pink bar that fills up pips. The more you hit your enemies, the more it builds up. If you take a hit, it goes down. Mages most likely will have mana and warriors may have rage in that it builds up as you deal damage, but also builds up as you take hits. Well, that's what I expect from rage anyway. Something that I will get if you don't hit that like button and subscribe right now. I'm feeling the rage building up guys. Just help me please. So really digest this. Every class will always have a ranged option. Yes, even warriors. We saw that rogues have the always available ranged option to fire an arrow and they slowly regenerate. One arrow every five seconds. Another rogue momentum attack is the hip fire option for the rogues bow, letting you pop off arrows from your waist. I don't remember seeing this one though. There's also a resource consuming warrior attack that lets you lob your shields at enemies so you can live out your Captain America fantasy. You apparently can build a whole playstyle around that according to Eurogamer. Quests are more handcrafted and mission based, curated with alternate paths, secrets to discover and optional content. It seems they learned from Inquisition and won't make this game feel like an MMO light, especially in the dreaded Hinterlands, the place that turned a generation off the Dragon Age series. I still, to this day, tell people to simply focus on the mainline missions and not to deviate, even though it's tempting, until well after the Hinterlands. Though that being said, there are open-ended explorable areas in the Veilguard. These will most likely be in select areas. Think Dragon Age Origins structure or even Mass Effect 2. According to an interview with IGN, the game director says, Yeah, so it's a mission-based game. Everything is hand-touched, hand-crafted, and very highly curated. We believe that's how we get the best narrative experience, the best moment-to-moment -moment experience. However, along the way, these levels that we go to do open up. Some of them have more exploration than others. Alternate branching paths, mysteries, secrets, optional content you're going to find and solve. So it does open up, but it's a mission-based highly curated game. She continues, she continues to discuss details on side quests and optional content. Some of them are highly curated, especially when it involves the motivations and the experiences of companions. You're really along on the journey with them. Others, you're investigating a missing family and the entirety of this bog is open up for you. You're searching for clues, finding a way to solve their disappearance. So really it's not a one size fits all solution, but I do want to emphasize that handcrafted and curated is our approach. And in the age of Ubisoft games, I really seem to appreciate the more handcrafted approach. IGN also mentions that one character might be able to plant a weakening debuff on an enemy and another character might be able to detonate them. Likewise, the bonds that Rook forges with companions like Neve, a detective and Harding who returns from Inquisition as a full partner, determine how party members grow and what abilities become available. This means that yes, the closer you get with a companion, the more powerful they'll become and the more options will be available to you. So yes, the party style is three characters, think Mass Effect, and there are a lot of similarities to Mass Effect and Andromeda's combat system, including combos. Combat is focused on real-time action, dodge, parry, counter, sophisticated animation cancelling, and branching using risk-reward charge attacks designed to break enemy armor layers. Enemies have elemental weaknesses and resistances, and you can chain together elemental combos for extra damage. We saw in the photo that Michael Gamble posted that Fade Bolt detonates sundered targets, aka targets who have had their armor reduced by an effect that can be applied by your attack here and Harding's attack here. The ability wheel neatly maps it out, so the best players will be setting themselves up to combo well with their companions and themselves, though without a doubt you won't be able to be ready for everything easily. One example of a combo is a squad mate using a gravity well attack to suck enemies in, another slowing them down, and the player then unleashing a big AoE attack. Hearing this, it's going to be hard for me to not roll as a powerful AoE based mage or warrior. So bringing up the weapon wheel pauses time until you release it. So you can be as tactical as you want to be or ignore it entirely. Michael Gamble also says it's a full pause and you can toggle it on a hold or a click of the button. According to Video Games Chronicle, combat looks fast and varied with melee weapons, ranged weapons and spells to fill out your arsenal. How much that will be respected for each character is yet to be seen, but as we watch the demo, Visions of a second, third, and fourth previews with totally different character builds sprung to life. If you want to be an armchair general and make sure that every single action is planned out to your exact specifications, you can do that too. 
It really does feel like there was a meeting at this game's inception to make sure that every little bit of every Dragon Age game that fans liked is included. Michael Gamble also confirms that yes, there will be damage numbers. I'm personally a fan of numbers popping up on my screen so I can feel a sense of achievement I simply don't get in real life. He also mentioned that there may or may not be finishing moves. Oh yes, bring on the violence. So this might be a pill to swallow, but you don't take direct control of companions like in past Dragon Age games, but you can still pause and issue ability commands for you and your allies. This was one key difference in the Dragon Age series that you could control your companions, but it makes sense. They want you to focus on your character. It's much more like Andromeda, where you can issue commands based on where you're currently focused. I know what you're thinking, did he just whiff that shot? Whoever's playing this demo consistently misses arrow headshots throughout their play session. So much so that it got back to Michael Gamble. He will not be releasing the name of the person who kept whiffing the bow headshots. Good, because we would be having words. So there's a hub area for the player like Skyhold and the Normandy called the Lighthouse. You have to expect this as hub areas are kind of Bioware's thing. You have to have a place to talk to your companions, build stuff, get missions, and well, get your freak on. Speaking of, companions can eventually start romancing other characters if you opt not to romance them. Think Garrus and Tali in the Citadel DLC or Ash and James. I'm just glad the companions in the Veilgar will find love because they're sure as hell not going to find it with me. According to an interview with Eurogamer, every regular companion is romanceable. Meanwhile though, there's an emphasis from Bioware on making each character's friendship just as meaningful, romance or no, which is great news to me because I don't want there to be hard feelings, you know? Each companion also has unique missions tied to them that play into the larger story, which is a change from them having their own kind of side quest that stands alone. I hope that if you do these missions, you'll get a better reward at the end. Kind of like Mass Effect 2 Suicide Mission, though that's less like a reward and more like you avoid horrible disaster if you do them. Same, same, right? The game director tells IGN, each one of the companions that you journey with has really complex backstories, problems of their own, deep motivations. And these play out through some really well fleshed out character arcs, missions that are unique to them, but ultimately tie into the larger story. And along the way we'll make consequential decisions for each of them, sometimes affecting who they are, sometimes heart wrenching. I've cried more than once and sometimes pretty joyous. So it's confirmed that no matter who you play as, you can romance every single one of your companions. It's because you're the hero after all, so why not? It's your story, you're just too damn irresistible. This is one for all you thirsty spice lovers, I see you. Nudity is confirmed and romance scenes can get a little spicy. This does underline the adult nature of the game, though honestly none of these women appeal to me, so like I mentioned, I'll completely miss that aspect. Thanks to the internet, I'm now bored with sex. Is there a place on the web that panders to my lust for violence? Yes, that M rating gets another use. There will be blood and gore. Here we see a post by Michael Gamble showing just that. Maybe the game is not as bright and cheery as we thought. Circling back to the character creator, it will be incredibly deep. Michael Gamble says it's the most featureful character creator ever. It includes five categories. Lineage, Appearance, Class, Faction, and Playstyle. The parts that stand out there are Lineage and Playstyle. According to Eurogamer, Lineage dictates things like your race, the usual Dragon Age quartet of Elf, Canari, Human, and Dwarf, as well as your backstory, a long-standing fan request. Backstories include things like factions, some returning, some new, which we've already gone through. Then there's playstyle settings that include custom, distinct difficulty settings for options as granular as parry windows. That means players who might fancy that playstyle but typically struggle with the finer points of combat can give it a go. So if you really don't like the difficulty of an action game, you can tune it down. Or you can tune it up if you really want a challenge. When it comes to appearance though, players can choose different body sizes and shapes. I hope that means we'll be able to make a morbidly obese character. I mean, they need love too, and I would absolutely make an obese dwarf if I could. According to Video Games Chronicle, they mentioned that in the game's character creator, all armor and clothing options will scale and mesh to any body type, a flexibility that's rarely seen in RPGs of this scale. Usually you're locked into one or two body types in order to make an armor piece fit well. Though, I mean, let's be real. The first thing most of you are going to be doing is seeing how far the boob slider goes up. I guess big breasted women deserve representation too, but I see the group of you over in the back there. Don't judge them. Some of you are out here sexualizing old men. I got my eye on you, Liz. An interview with Eurogamer doesn't quite confirm it, 
but there is hope. There's also a range of full body customization options like a triangular slider between body types and individual settings down to everything from shoulder width to uh, glute volume. That's your bottom. I know a few of you are thinking it because James certainly was. You aren't forced to be anything but straight. Just chill. You won't be turned gay unless you really want to be. You can totally create your character and a ton of aspects of it. Michael also claims they'll do a deep dive on it as well. Now, this is a big point as Inquisition didn't really have many hairstyles. There will be dozens of hairstyles to choose from with individual strands of hair rendered separately and reacting quite remarkably to in-game physics. Pulled from EA Sports, though I'm not exactly sure I trust the range of EA Sports. EA Sports. It's in the game. A nice quality of life feature is that the character creator lets you adjust the lighting so you can be sure your character looks good. I remember spending hours on my first character in Inquisition only for it to come out looking like an anemic Dracula. I want to suck your blood, but first let me sit down for a second. The team wanted to balance both light and darkness. When everything is dark, nothing really feels dark. For this one, we wanted to build that contrast again. So in terms of tone, I really hope that means there's truly something evil in the world and not everything is magical unicorn fart happiness all the time. I think this was personally one of the reasons I didn't like Andromeda as much as the others and I like Dragon Age Origins more than 2 and Inquisition. Skipping ahead, the team mentions that you could potentially lose some characters during the story. So death may be a theme and having some real stakes and consequences is what I think a game like this needs. Michael Gamble says that he can confirm that it's just as grim as his predecessors. Darkspawn, Gore, and The Blight. My gosh, The Blight. Just stop pumping me up, Michael. I'm not ready for disappointment. When it comes to dialogue, though, oh boy. I made a joke review of Andromeda recently, and if you like to laugh, go watch that. I have to say, my reaction at the end of that video is actually real, including the door slam. According to PC Gamer, readers who are actually just me will be glad to hear that Bioware seems to have resisted the Mass Effect Andromeda proclivity for grating, quippy dialogue in this one, at least. Varric makes some jokes, sure, but people spoke mostly like dramatic fantasy, people in my time in Minrathus. So good news all around, especially for me who really didn't enjoy the dialogue in Andromeda as much as I would have liked. One thing I love in RPGs is really customizing my character. In Veilguard, the skill tree is vast. You can also set up specific companions with certain kits, from tackling specific enemy types to being more of a supportive healer or flexible all-rounder so you won't be pigeonholed into a particular role at character creation. I like having the option to restart the game as a different playstyle, as long as they truly feel different. We saw that characters do have heals, so that's confirmed returning to the game. So there are tarot cards you go through during the character creation process that will let you choose decisions from past games to implement into Veilguard, meaning you'll be able to customize your journey from the get-go. This is important because it doesn't seem like importing your save file will be a thing in Veilguard. Instead, you'll choose the choices you made and customize your Inquisitor. IGN confirms this in an interview with the game director. What's not lost on us is that it's been 10 years since existing players have played. They might not remember what they did in previous games. They may need that refresher and we don't want new players to feel like they're missing out on those decisions. So in the character creator, I like to call it last time on Dragon Age, but you get to go into your past adventures and it, actually through tarot cards, tells you what the context was and what decisions you want to make. When pressed further about if all the previous characters would be woven into the Veil Guard, like Hawk, the director says, I won't say everybody, but yes, some of them. So Dragon Age Veil Guard won't read saves from Dragon Age Origins, Dragon Age 2 or Dragon Age Inquisition, confirmed by the game director. The technology is so different and we wanted it to be in client. This leans into the fact that you can play this game fully offline and doesn't require a connection to a client. Therefore, you don't need to use the online Dragon Age Keep feature. So that's everything we know about the game so far. What do you think? More or less excited? Let me know below. Also, if you want that boob slider in the game, hit that like and sub. The more likes I get, the more I'll push the devs for it to go way up. If you don't like out of protest, I'll push them to remove the butt slider. So yeah, I have your number folks, don't test me. For everything RPG, you're in the right place. Ciao, friends.